OK, let's start with a case. You're in clinic and a nine-year-old boy comes in because he's limping. He's hot and feels miserable. He's had a couple of school sores and sore throat in the past. You try to get him to walk, but he's not too keen. What's your differential? Perthase, septic arthritis, maybe osteomyelitis? What if I tell you that this is how you got to work today? We're in remote northern Australia and this boy is indigenous. Does that add anything to your differential? I'm Mel Thompson. I'm a paediatrician in the Kimberley. And I'm here to talk with you about one disease that should be on your radar. Let's talk acute rheumatic fever. If you're new to northern Australia, or your workplace looks more like this than this, this talks for you. If you live in the city, then you might see these kids when they're transferred for surgery, when they're at school or a new university. Or if you're just interested in interesting medicine or in health equity, then rheumatic fever's right up your alley. A US government website describes rheumatic fever as a disease of developing nations but it exists right here. Our numbers in Western Australia have increased from six in 2008 to 75 in 2012, with 58 of those from the Kimberley region. That's in a population about the size of Wagga Wagga. Now, there's no doubt ascertainment and reporting factors at play here, but we do seem to be seeing a genuine spike in numbers. These high rates are not new news. Around the world, rheumatic fever is a disease of displaced and poor populations, and Australia has the highest rates in the world, streets ahead of our nearest neighbours, New Zealand. So, congratulations Australia. We're leading the world. But I'm really not proud of these numbers, and we need to know how to recognise rheumatic fever when it happens. In 1944, Dr. T. Duckett-Jones outlined his criteria to diagnose acute rheumatic fever. He lends his name to the nice little mnemonic, Jones, joints, nodules, erythema marginatum, and Sydenham's career. What about the heart, you say? Well, that fits in here. Let's go through these. Joints, or arthritis, is often what kids come in with. This picture shows nicely what these kids look like. They're miserable, hot, their legs too painful to walk. Look for inflamed joints, often knees and ankles, with a typical migratory pattern. In high-risk populations, this includes the ever-challenging monoarthritis. Look for a septic joint, but don't forget rheumatic fever. Carditis is what kills. I've seen two primary school kids in the last few months with severe mitral regurgitation needing urgent valve replacements. Listen for the murmur or a pericardial rub and check for signs of failure. If everything seems normal, don't discount rheumatic fever. Cardiac involvement can take a few weeks. Sydenham's career is rare, but it happens. These kids' movements might be called tics, twitches, jerks, spasms, or even seizures. Like this young lady, they bob their heads and flick their hands, can't drink from a cup, can't write their names, and may have trouble walking. The other two criteria are both quite rare, but highly specific for rheumatic fever. Erythema marginatum may be difficult to see, spreads outwards, and is not itchy. Nodules, if present, are painless and mobile. The minor criteria provide supporting evidence. Fever, high inflammatory markers, and prolonged PR interval all help make the diagnosis. Arthralgia without arthritis may also point to acute rheumatic fever. And of course, we need evidence of the bug that triggered it all in the first place, group A streptococcus. Kids in high-risk populations might have quite high teeters already, and so we'd recommend using the levels available in the rheumatic fever guideline. So let's add up the criteria for our case. 
say he has a swollen knee and ankle. That's one major criterion. Fever and perhaps a high CRP give him two minor. Positive serology and he's over the line. Always err on the side of diagnosing rheumatic fever in a high-risk population, as presentations may be subtle, especially for recurrences. So what do we do? Prevent by treating sore throats and impetigo early. Recognise the disease. Treat newly diagnosed kids with penicillin and regular non-steroidals. Notify the case to the local public health program. And most importantly, tell the parents what's happening, tell the kids themselves, and especially tell the teenagers. Explain what rheumatic fever is, give them a handout, and explain again at the next visit. Kids with rheumatic fever need four weekly benzathine penicillin injections until they're 21 years old, or at least 10 years, whichever is the longer. They need this when they're sick, when they're well, when they're on a footy trip, when they're pregnant, every month until they're 21. It's your job to make sure that happens. Rheumatic Heart Disease Australia has some great resources on their website, including the guideline that was a primary source for this talk. They have some e-learning modules, and there's even an app, so no excuses. Rheumatic fever is not a medical history footnote. It exists today. It ruptures kids' valves, threatens their lives, and causes lifelong heart damage. It is preventable and treatable, but it first needs to be recognised. Don't forget rheumatic fever. Let's try to keep up with the Joneses.